the old model of uh, you know your parents want you to go study hard, get good grades, go to the best university in the world, get the highest degree you can get, and then your whole life is set. Those days are over. Aww. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys should just leave YouTube and go and have a good time. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, what really distressed me was I gave a TEDx talk, TEDx youth talk in Malaysia, they hunt you, and this was a couple of years ago. And what happened was there was a um, there was a Malaysian boy, there was a PhD graduate from Cambridge, that killed himself because uh, his mother was nagging him that he wasn't making the kind of money that he was making. But those kind of you know, and that's the whole problem. The whole paradigm has shifted, right? You know, getting a degree and actually being able to solve problems are not necessarily the same thing. Um, you know, I was telling somebody just now, like even Cisco, the top black team, right, the, the top security team. They don't hire from the universities anymore. They go to the Black Hat Conference in Las Vegas and hire the hackers. Because the university takes at least three years to bring anything out. And your iPad is less four, four years old, right? So how do you do that? Which is why Singularity was formed, right? The things are moving too slow. Oh, sorry. Um, so you, you're seeing a lot of this disruptive technology coming in, disrupting companies. For example, I don't know whether you guys know Blockbuster. You know Blockbuster, right? I mean, you know, Blockbuster was worth $6 billion today, it's bankrupt. Netflix is growing up, right? It's not less than the Blockbuster. It doesn't need buildings. Blockbuster needs to have a physical brick and mortar. But, you know, Netflix is just a platform, right? Now, Blockbuster wasn't stupid. It's not that they sat there and said, ah, you know what, you know, we don't care about Netflix, you know, it's not going to eat our lunch. They knew what's happening. So there were people within Blockbuster that knew that, you know, if they don't jump on the electronic streaming bandwagon, digital bandwagon, they're going to lose out. But unfortunately, this is, what, you know, this is from a book from Salim Ismail called Exponential Organization, The Faculty of Singularity. It talks about how the autoimmune system attacks itself. Right? So some smart guys in the company said, let's create e-blockbuster to compete against Netflix. But who are, the, who, are the, who are the board of managing directors and top management guys? These are all the traditional guys that brought the money in, right? The guys that own the brick and mortar. Thing. And they're like, you nuts? I'm going to give you money to kill myself. I'm not going to do that. And by the time they realize they do it, they went bankrupt. So that's one example. Another example is uh, Kodak, right? Kodak at its peak had about 165,000 people around the world. Instagram, when they sold to Facebook, it had 12 people, right? For a billion dollars. Today, Kodak is bankrupt, right? Things have changed. But unfortunately, you know, when we talk to the politicians, they're more concerned about how many jobs are you creating if you're doing a startup. Now, that's, that's a death knell for technological startups. Okay, if you're a lot of people, you open a call center, right? I mean, you know, it's not going to it's not gonna gel. Let me give you a few examples. I mean, Kodak invented a digital camera that killed it, killed itself. They thought it was a toy. They didn't see that it could disrupt themselves. What's the cost of taking a photo with a Kodak uh, film camera? About a dollar, okay? The processing cost, the film, the paper, and so on. <coughs> How much did it cost to take a photo with your smartphone? Zero, right? You're disrupting not just the film industry, you're disrupting the camera industry, you're disrupting the photo printing industry, you're disrupting a whole chain of supply. And Kodak blew up. Kodak was so big, they owned their, they had their own nuclear reactor. But when they went bankrupt, uh, you see a California Berkeley in the basement, they, you know, Kodak had one of their reactors in there and they didn't know what to do with it. I mean, it's a nuclear reactor because they actually take Kodak, uh, you know, the, the radiography films and stuff like that. So that's another example. And then Nokia, Nokia Mobile, they spent $8.5 billion and they bought uh, Naftec. Naftec had 26 million kilometers of roads in Europe and around the world. So when iPhone came out, Nokia thought that by buying Naftec, they will own the GPS market. Right, because it was the biggest mapping software that they was out there. But then Waze came out, and Waze in Israel, I think in 2009. Waze don't have 26 million kilometers of road, but they have 26 million subscribers that are basically filling up the roads for them for free, right? And Waze got sold uh, recently, right, to uh, Google, and Nokia ended up, I think Nokia Mobile ended up being sold to. Uh, to uh, Microsoft for $8.5 for $8 billion, the same amount of money they paid for NAFTEC. So this is where disruption can come in very quickly. Uh, the other thing, I, I don't have a graph here, maybe, maybe in the next slide. Um, Airbnb, you guys know Airbnb, right? Airbnb 
current valuation is about, I don't know what the current valuation is, but the valuation last time was $10.5 billion. Okay? Hyatt International, the world's biggest hotel chain, is valued at $8.5 billion. What's the difference? What's the difference? Hyatt International, to add one additional room, will have to build a hotel, right? And manage it. For Airbnb to add one additional room, what's it cost them? Basically nothing. You just add your room in there. Just like Uber, right? It has no, you know, basically this is a platform here. It owns no assets. And this is the difference between, um, you know, um, between what you have in, in terms of uh, disruptive companies, exponential companies that are growing exponentially as, as opposed to companies that are growing linearly. So what's the future of jobs like? Um, you know, the future of jobs, I mean, they're like, I don't know whether you know, at the turn of last century, at the turn of 20th century, there were only, um, I think, 90, was it 93%? of Americans who were involved in the agricultural society, the agrarians, the farmers. Today, it's less than 5%. It's a reversal, right? Don't tell me that everybody's jobless. It's not, right? New jobs come out. So one of the new jobs, you know, the thing is that if you're going to be replaced by a machine, you will be replaced by a machine. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Okay, that's, that's a given. But there are new jobs coming out. You might be needing people like robot counselors, maybe to counsel robots. Maybe. And the key is that humans working with machines. Let me give you an example. Uh, you know, my, my daughter is here co coaching chess, right? And uh, she used to be uh, one of the uh, national champion team for the women chess in Australia. And my other daughter was actually at YouTube before. Actually, it's interesting story I should tell you. She did pharmacy for one year, hated it, and then switched to engineering, didn't like it. So I said, you know, go to Bondo Humanity, see what it'd be like. And uh, she did that, did really well, did criminal profiling, did communications, did international relations. And then now she says she's like counting money, she needs other people's money, so she's doing a master in financial accounting. But the point of the story is that she, yeah, I don't know, I don't know, tell people how much you make now, can I ask you? I don't know. $40. Uh, $40 or 45 bucks an hour, right? As a teaching chess in schools. A, pharmac a graduate pharmacist today makes about 30 bucks an hour after five years of education. So what does that tell you, right? And, and basically, you know, the education system and the job market is kind of disjointed. Previously, you need accreditation. Now what you need is the industry accreditation. That's what you really need. So a human player, for example, an amateur human chess player, playing against a grandmaster will probably lose. A computer algorithm by itself will also probably lose. But a human chess, amateur chess player, coupled with a computer algorithm, can easily defeat a grandmaster. So this is show you that if you combine the two, you actually get an exponential growth. Um, another example is, you know spreadsheets, right? Excel spreadsheet. You have sheets that are laid all over the floor. That's why I call spreadsheets in the old days. So if I want you to do a what-if analysis, if I increase my marginal cost, you know, my, or my, my, my margin by 10%, what would my profit be at the end? You know, I have like tons of like account clubs or bookkeepers just adding numbers up. So I don't know what it is. Today, I can do it on a spreadsheet, on a single cell, and immediately get all the data, right? So that's the thing that's the difference. I mean, you know, like, it has made you, you know, thousands of times more productive than what you are before. It was what technology is doing. You just need to know how to use it. Another example is a librarian, right? I mean, you know, everybody thought that when the internet came in, librarians are going to be useless. They're all going to be jobless. You know what happened in reality? The salary of librarians actually went up skyrocketing. Because now, they can do much more with their time than they could do before. If you want to know what the name of the 12 reindeers that Santa had, you know, in the old days, you had to go to Google and Encyclopedia and look it up. Today, you Google it and get it immediately. They became more efficient and therefore more productive and therefore more valuable. So you can watch the talk at TED Talk called, uh, you know, I can't remember the name of the guy that he manufactured. It's a, 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 I think a $22,000 robot where a human worker with a robot easily and more productively and actually, um, you know, more synergy than a robot replacing a person. I mean, the other thing that's going to change our education system, right? I mean, I'm a big follower of Ken Robinson and Sugata Mitra. And basically, you know, the problem that our education system is that we are testing people for to find out answers that are normally found in the back of the book. And everybody in the class has to have the same answer. If your answer is different, you are wrong. So how do you have creativity and innovation like that? I mean, there, there, there are many different areas of judge a person's intelligence. It's not just purely by exams, right? That's what we're doing right now. And the education system we have today is inherited from the British Empire. They teach you the three R's, right? Reading, writing, and computing. Why? To 
turn it into a computer so it can be a cog in the wheel of the entire. Right? They can plug you from Karachi and stick you in Glasgow and you still function well in it. Right? Now we have machines, right? The empire is gone, but they're still following the same educational system. I mean, this is a big, so this is this thing I always argue with my kids' teachers, right? They want them to go to remedial writing class. I mean, in reality, when my kids graduate, do you think they will actually be using a pen to write? You know, they'll probably be thinking whatever they need to think to write. They'll probably just come out, of, you know, at the very least keyboard or voice. So I think, you know, we kind of are disjoint in terms of uh, where we're heading with technology. Uh, this is Sumara Mitra. If you haven't seen his talk, you should watch his talk. He won the TED Prize, a uh, million dollar prize, about I think a year and a half ago, uh, for the self-organized learning environment toolkit. He basically um, famous for doing this project. In I think in back in 2006, uh, when computers just start ramping up PCs, you know, in India, all his uh, friends with kids, you know, coming to him and saying, "Oh, my son's a genius! I bought him a computer, and he made this amazing, you know, a picture or amazing sound." And he thought to himself, "Is it only uh, kids, rich kids, with computers that are smart, or any kid with a computer can be smart?" So he did this experiment called the hole in the wall. He took a computer stuck it on a wall in a slum in India with no instruction manual, nothing. And he came back two weeks later to find the kids in the slum couldn't even speak English or read. Start downloading music and doing all kind of amazing stuff. He, he repeated the experiment again uh, in <coughs> with a private school. This time he downloaded all the information about biology, uh, about, about DNA and stuff. And these are like kids from the age of 8 to 12, I think, or something like that. And asked them to learn about DNA. You know? And these kids don't even speak English. And uh, you know, he downloaded Wikipedia and all that stuff and told them that's what I wanted to learn. And uh, basically he came back, I think it's three weeks later or three months, I can't remember now. And the kids all oh, said, oh, I'm very sorry, sir, you know, we don't understand all of this stuff, but I know that the uh, the you know, mutation of the gene, you know, like